Hi everyone! Thank you for joining me for this conference named Why Bringing 2D into a 3D Game Engine May Change the Animation Industry. The Hannes title could have been Why Making Something as Ambitious as Developing a Whole New 2D Software in a Game Engine When You'll Must Have No Money and Just a Fistful of People to Do It. But this was way too long and not so appealing. Anyway, take a seat, grab a drink, and let me answer the question. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Elodie Mug, and I've been working in the animation industry for about 15 years. Do not search for my name in film credits, because I am neither an animator, nor a film director, nor a producer. Actually, in 15 years, from what I know, the only credit you can find my name is in The Song of the Sea by Tom Moore. Which was really kind of him, actually. Well, after I graduated a humble animation school in Luxembourg, I had the opportunity to join, as a tech sales agent, a company developing a 2D animation software. And as a tech sales agent, my job was to sell an animation software and to support all the artists using it by training them and understanding their needs. In fact, I was kind of a bridge between developers and final users. I did this for almost 10 years, and during this decade, I met incredible people like Glenkin, Blaze Brothers, Bancroft Brothers, and I visited amazing places such as Disney, DreamWorks, Pixar, Cartoon Saloon, Tatsunoko Prod in Japan, and the list goes on. But the most incredible people I met during this period were actually my colleagues. You can see some of us on this picture, and you may notice how good-looking we are. This picture was taken four years ago in February 2018 at the 45th Annual Awards. This peculiar year, all of us were representing our former employer to receive, on its behalf, the Herb I Work Award for developing a technology having a significant impact on the industry of the art and animation. It meant really something to us. Because even if the award was for our employer, we knew deep in our hearts that we were the people who made it possible. Sadly, shareholders of this company did not agree with us, and that very same year of 2018, we either quitted our jobs or got fired. To be transparent with you, this was not the happiest period of our lives. However, we thought it was really, really a shame to say goodbye to each other and go our own way. You know, we've been working together for years, we knew each other very well, we could say we were experts in the animation industry, we just had to find a way to keep working together, and doing what we do the best, making tools for 2D animators. Against all odds, the solution was in a game software named Unreal Engine. I know we are at FMX and I'm pretty sure you know what Unreal Engine is. But let me do a brief explanation just in case. Unreal Engine is a software developed by the American company Epic Games since 1991. It's been used to make great video games like Unreal Tournament, which was loved by people from my generation, and Fortnite for the younger ones. As a game engine, Unreal is a 3D real-time software. It means that contrary to other 3D software, which require quite a long time to render a result with lights, shadows, and stuff, Unreal Engine can display the result in real time, if your computer is powerful enough. For several years, real-time technologies like Unreal Engine have been used in other industries such as architecture, automotive, broadcast, and live feature films or series. You might ask right now, what is the connection between my colleagues and I being unemployed and Unreal Engine, right? Well, a set of circumstances allowed us to meet key people working for Epic Games. They showed us all the potential of Unreal Engine, and after that, we thought, damn, that would be awesome to bring 2D animation in such an environment. I mean, can you picture it? Having a tool where 2D characters could easily interact with 3D props and buildings, with amazing camera moves, and the ability to easily change elements like lights, clouds, shadows, the wind blowing through grass and leaves. That was very exciting. You know, 
between the years 2000 and 2010, there was kind of a silly war between pro-2D people and pro-3D people. For some, 3D was a cold and heartless technique, for the 2D was an art from the past. I was indeed in the pro-2D team, but it turns out we were all wrong, because both techniques have good and bad sides. For instance, in my opinion, 2D traditional animation is spontaneous, it reflects the personality of the animator. But traditional animation gets too complicated when you need to reuse elements for series, when you need to change the animation, or when you need to play with perspectives like buildings and vehicles. 3D, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It requires much more planification to sculpt and rig characters before you can actually move them. But once it's done, you can reuse them and move them as many times as you need. Let's be honest, the vast majority of series and films made for the past 10 years has required 2D and 3D. Some productions are more 2D-ish, some are more 3D-ish, but examples are still numerous. Arkan by Fortish Prod, The Mitchells Against the Machines by Sony Pictures Animation Studio, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, also by Sony Picture Animation Studio, The Amazing World of Gumball by Nickelodeon, Peanuts by Blue Sky, Either and Ernest by Lupus Film, Wolf Walkers by Cotton Saloons. And the list goes on and on. And as a person whose the job consisted in giving tech support in productions all across the world, I can tell you that the need of mixing 2D and 3D has been stronger year after year. And if you look at the next feature films coming like Puss in Boots 2 or Bad Guys, both by DreamWorks, or the second movie Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, you can tell that stylized rendering is the new trend. However, the solutions to make 2D animation in a 3D real-time environment are very limited. Either you have to mix lots of software together, or you have to use features from software that were not designed for 2D animators. So, let's go back to late 2018. My team and I have just discovered the potential of Unreal Engine, and we've just co-founded Praxinos to create a software named Odyssey, which will use Unreal Engine as a technical base. What a program indeed! However, let me summarize our situation at all time. Okay, we are expert in 2D animation software, that was a fact, but regarding 3D? Well, some of us had a good knowledge in 3D, but globally, there was still a lot to learn. We had never used Unreal Engine before, we just had personal computers and personal hardware to work, and as a company, we were penniless. Plus, Praxinus is a cooperative company, which means the company belongs to its workers and we can't ask for investors or venture capital to give us money in exchange of social shares. We did not choose the easiest path, indeed. And even if the main feeling was, oh boy, what are we doing? Are we going to make it? The beginning of this new adventure was still very exciting. Anyway, step by step, we succeeded to get funds like French subsidies and a loan, which allowed us to invest in good and powerful computers. And after spending three months analyzing Unreal Engine, we were able to understand the magnitude of the task. Our first mistake was to develop directly in Unreal Engine's core. It was a mistake because each time we had to compile the code to proceed with tests, it would literally take hours. Quickly, we had to change our strategy and start thinking in bricks or in modules, so we would just have to compile these parts and not the whole engine. Eventually, this was a very clever way to work because Unreal Engine itself is split into many modules. Then, we could list the needs and design a roadmap how to switch between a 2D and 3D interface, how to draw, how to make animation, how to structure scenes and shots, and how to make a user-friendly interface. We started with the two first statements simply because in early 2019, there was no solution to draw or to paint in Unreal Engine. You could not create an image from scratch. There was no way to create a digital brush to imitate watercolor or pencil, and graphic tablets would just work basically as a mouse. And obviously, you can't make a 2D traditional animation software if you can't draw. 
This is why we focused first on a brick to draw in Unreal Engine. Fortunately, we had at least two elements from Unreal Engine that would help us to get started. First, the asset type Texture 2D. Texture 2D is an asset created by Unreal Engine when it imports JPEGs and PNGs into its huge library named the Canton Browser. So, the idea was to be able to create a Texture 2D directly from Unreal Engine without importing an external reference. Then, the idea was to develop a specific interface to edit this Texture 2D like you would do with any other drawing software. In this interface, you would need a canvas, a color wheel, a layer stack to work on several levels, and a painting tool with a few options, such as size or opacity, which leads me to the second element, Blueprint. Blueprint is a nodal-based coding language derivative from C++. This language can be used in Unreal Engine to code video games or to make helpful plugins to work faster. At Praxinos, we used Blueprint to create a brush engine. We had all the mechanics to do the math. All we had to do was just creating specific nodes for a brush engine, such as a node to create a stamp, nodes to apply colors and manage the stamp's transparency, everything related to transforms like resize, rotation, or shear, and everything related to pen stylus input, pressure, altitude, azimuth, rotation, and position. And so, step by step, we were able to build a drawing tool with an Unreal Engine. We are in June 2019. This is still very basic, but functional. And at this point, we can see how cool it is to edit textures and see the update in real time in Unreal Engine. We are two weeks away from the animation film market in Annecy, where we will be exhibiting at Epic Games booth. And one of my colleagues suggests something. Guys, there is still a lot to do before finishing Odyssey. What if we release this brick as a plugin for the Unreal Engine? That was a brilliant idea. You see, the real question underneath was, do we keep working underground for years and take the risk to fail when we release a DC because of a lack of feedback? Or do we release the first brick as a plugin to get it tested by artists all over the globe and make it better? We all agree this was a great idea, and six months and one mega grant later, we released Iliad on Unreal Engine Marketplace. We even decided to release it for free to get as many feedback as possible. Today, there are more than 130,000 accounts across the world using this plugin, and our community on Discord is growing weeks after weeks. That's kind of an achievement we can be proud of. Okay, making a drawing module in Unreal Engine? Check. Now we can easily draw in a 2D context. The next step, obviously, is to draw in a 3D context. After all, the whole idea is to make 2D animation in a 3D environment. So, let's analyze and understand the big picture of the process. First, the logical of Unreal Engine means we have to paint on a static mesh. We can't draw out of nowhere. We need a support, a canvas to draw. So we need a plane with a static mesh, an asset, Texture 2D, as we saw earlier, and a material that will link together the Texture 2D to the static mesh. Ideally, this material should be translucent, so we can see the 3D background behind our character. And ideally, all of these steps should be done in one click, because doing it all by hand takes time, and this is not intuitive for artists who have never worked in 3D before. Second, we can't just wander in the environment and move from planes to planes. That doesn't make sense. Instead, we need a camera to be in front of each plane, and we need these cameras to be called at a specific moment thanks to a timeline. And good news, everyone! These two elements, the camera and the timeline, which is named Sequencer, already exist in Unreal Engine. And because we want to make the whole process easier, the idea would be to easily create shots, camera, planes, materials, and texture in one or two clicks. Sounds easy, right? 
Not so much, actually. In early 2020, even if we had been already working on Unreal Engine for a whole year, there were still two big challenges to overcome. The ability to paint directly on 3D objects, whether they are round like a sphere or flat like a plane, changing the whole philosophy of the sequencer. What do I mean by changing the philosophy of this sequencer? Well, the sequencer is kind of a timeline to make sequences into video games. And like any editing software, its purpose is to assemble together different objects that already exist to make a video footage. But our approach at Proxinus is to create assets like shots, materials, and texture 2D, and actors like the plane and the camera through the sequencer. If I explain it differently, we change the sequencer from being a module for assembly to being a module for creation. And that's something. To achieve this, we had to analyze the code of the sequencer, which took several months. Everything was going well, until we got struck by the major event of 2020 that shook up the entire world. Yes, you know what I'm talking about. Really, I'm half serious, half kidding. You probably thought I was talking about the pandemic, but actually, we were not so affected by it since we already had the tools to work remotely from home. And from what I know, the whole animation and video game industry adapted pretty well to the situation. The announcement of Unreal Engine 5, on the other hand, was a true surprise, especially because we had no idea of what kind of deep changes in the core of Unreal Engine we should expect. Potentially, it could make all our development obsolete, or it could not affect our work at all. Back in these days, we had no idea. But well, show must go on. We had to focus on improving our painting plugin Iliad to make it work in a 3D context. And we had to develop what would become our second plugin, Epos. Epos uses all the mechanics explained previously and it slowly became a storyboard manager plugin. The idea of Epos is to create the spatial and temporal structure of a storyboard in Unreal Engine by placing cameras and planes in the environment, and then switch from shots to shots thanks to the sequencer. Then, you enable Ilya to draw on each plane and create various drawings to tell the story. Contrary to Iliad, when Epos reached the MVP stage, it was not released on the marketplace to be used by a thousand of unknown people. Instead, we selected a dozen of studios and about 30 people to beta test it between July 2021 and March 2022. We opted for a closed beta test because this break of Odyssey was so important, we had to be sure it would meet the needs of storyboard making in a 3D environment. And the best way to achieve this is by having regular meetings with beta testers to improve the tool according to their feedback. What's the result of it? Well, I will let two of our beta testers answer this question. David Park and Ash Buddy from the studio Passion Pictures in London. Hello FMX, I am David Park, an executive producer at Passion Pictures Animation and producer of an in-progress short film at Passion Pictures we're working on in conjunction with Epic Games. And I'm Ashley Body. I was the story artist on the short film. We're excited to chat about our experience with Epic and Praxinos EPOS tool and to show you some sneak peeks at all the lovely work going into Passion's new short film, directed by Oscar winner and Passion founder Andrew Ruhlman. It's called The Day I Became a Bird. This is an early test that we worked on. So what is Bird? Bird is a 12 minute short film Passion is co-producing with Epic through their Mega Grants program. And it was an excellent test bed for storyboarding with a new tool. I've been in animation for about 20 years. Most of that time spent at Pixar before coming to Locksmith Animation in London 
and then to Passion. On several projects, we toyed with boarding in 3D or boarding over previs sets, but previs cameras rarely ended up in the hands of story artists, so EPOS was intriguing. And Ash the Tinkerer had just started boarding the shore. So, Ash? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, before Passion, I worked at Aldman Animations and then more recently Locksmith in London as well. And in the background, I've always been working on my own back burner projects. A bit of a tinkerer using After Effects and Blender and trying to bring the 3D world and 2D world together in a kind of a 2.5D hybrid. Um, when Bird came up and they told us they were going to be using Unreal, which I had heard of, obviously, and Epos, which I had never heard of, but when I was told it's trying to merge the 2D and 3D worlds, it made sense to get involved, play around with these new tools, and help Praxnos get it into the hands of the people who are going to be using it. Um, you know, once artists get hold of this kind of tool, we're going to use it in ways that are kind of unexpected, very much in the same way that something like Photoshop isn't really technically designed for storyboarding, but we still use it and adapt it to our needs. Personally, when it comes to new software, it's always a bit daunting. Um, various packages are all really similar, but just different enough to be confusing. There's a lot going on, you know, various things, modeling, layout, rigging, nodes, honestly, yeah, intimidating. And to top it off, I hadn't actually worked with Unreal Engine before, so that brought the games engine into the, into the equation. Um, I was completely green. Uh, luckily, Epic provided us with a lot of support, um, all the online courses that they have. And we also had our Epic tech point person, Juan Brockhaus, who helped me get used to the Unreal environment and took the long time to explain to me in very simple terms what was going on. So thank you, Juan. Um, I think a lot of time he was surprised at what we were doing at Epos as, as we were what we were trying to achieve in it and just getting to that goal of boarding in 3D. Um, as I mentioned before, I come from a stop motion background, so I'm quite used to very tactile sets. Um, once a project gets to a certain point in production, the art department's built the sets and we would be able to get down on those units with our phones, take pictures, frame things up, and we take it back to our computers do drawer overs and it quickly gave us a sense of the space and helped in deciding you know where we're going to place our camera it's quite an important consideration um, the lens is that audience relationship to the character so how close it is how far it is it all has an effect on on the storytelling um, to find something that could work that way in cg well i haven't come across anything that quite performs in the same way as, as, as a scouting tool uh, epos it kind of ticked all those boxes it allowed us to get into the space of the set and be able to draw within it. And I'd say it emulated the same kind of thing as in a CG environment that I was able to do in stop motion. Um, using Epos and Unreal had a very similar feeling to getting there onto the set and looking through that camera lens and getting a sense of the space that you're going to be using, um, the space you'll be filming in. So what we're kind of looking at on the screen at the moment is, you know, going into that space and placing something in the space so I can draw straight onto it. And you can do this in the 3D part of the software. And also, yeah, it pops up in a, a 2D uh, area as well. Initially, when I started it, I approached it with a few questions and goals in mind um, using Epos. You know, how does this tool fit in? How can we use it? Where does it fit into the workflow? But one of the big ones was, can I make things easier for the more technically difficult things in storyboarding? There are some tasks which are quite hard to achieve, things like two node camera work. You know, moving that camera through space can be quite a time consuming process to make it look correct. Um, or restaging notes. Quite often we'll get notes like, can you bring the camera around about 10 degrees or square up on this character? Um, these are often quite simple requests, but you still have to do the adjustment across multiple panels and it can be quite time consuming redrawing all of that. So having the functionality of the camera in 3D space made the process a lot simpler. Uh, you can just shift the camera around a bit and there it is, it's moving through the environment. It's always been difficult to achieve that in storyboards, creating the illusion of passing over terrain or through the space, like trucking down a corridor. Um, as opposed to just zooming in on a flat image. There's a few tricks you can do, but with Epos, it's a huge help in getting that shot idea that's inside your head out faster without having to go through all the technical. And once that shot exists in Unreal, it's a bit easier to iterate and add poses and move the camera, you know, that 10 degrees. 
which is just, you know helpful when trying to hit a deadline because you're not getting bogged down in trying to redo technical drawings. So that's kind of what I was trying to figure out. Is this an area that Epos could help me achieve those kind of things? In terms of the workflow, still started with a thumbnail pass or rough pass and then jumped into Epos after that to, to board the scene up, kind of replacing the tie down. One thing I was very wary of was the pitfall of entering the 3D world and getting lost in it. The you know, In a 3D space, your brain goes from a creative point of view to a more technical one. You enter that 3D abyss. So that's why we initially boarded on paper to get a sense of the shots that we wanted, patterns we were going for, and general storytelling. Then moving into Epos, we had all that set up in a very rough way. And as I said, you know, we were able to explore some of the more cinematic elements of the film, camera placement, lens choice, and, and essentially replace the tie down stage of, of storyboarding. Um, finding out what was actually in the Epos toolkit and how I wanted to use it was, uh, was quite interesting. Bear in mind, I was also learning Unreal at the same time. I um, tried to do things I'd done in other 3D software and Praxnox was very helpful when it came to adding in those features such as empty objects in the sequencer so that I could attach a camera to it. I was a big user of null objects in After Effects. There were also things I discovered that I didn't even really know I wanted. Um, there's this really cool thing with planes in space so that they scale upwards as you move them further back, allowing for distance and parallaxes, which is a great feature, kind of like mental canvas, which I didn't think I'd initially use, but after playing around with it a bit, it's given me a few ideas on ways to use it if I don't have a 3D modeled environment to work within. Um, I suppose I started using 3D software and hadn't, when I was using this, I hadn't really considered using Unreal even as a scouting tool. But now that I've used it, I'd say that the ease of use of the cameras is why I would just carry on using it. Praxinos is still developing Epos. The drawing tool is getting better, improving in ways you can interact images in the 3D environment. They're always adding to it. Uh, recently, they added an onion skin, which is awesome, helps a lot. And yeah, tweaking the drawing tool to make it that much stronger. I quite like this one where you can draw on a 2D area and it appears in the 3D one. So you can choose, pick and choose whether you're gonna draw in 2D or 3D, which is quite helpful as well. Looking to the future, I'd quite like to bring Epos into a team environment and see how it fits with multiple people storyboarding on one project. Um, feature films have larger teams, so being able to integrate it as part of the toolkit in story would be interesting to see how it works. As a story artist, I'm hoping it would save me time and also other people time, especially with the more technical elements of the job. Um, being able to get into that space and because of the way Unreal works, get the art department into the space, the DOP, perhaps the producer, so they can tell us we're spending too much money. And, you know, have the discussions about how we're going to use this earlier in the process could be very helpful and, and quite important as well. So being able to use Epos and have the story artists express the ideas without the time it traditionally takes to do that could, you know, I think it could be really beneficial. Back to you, David. Uh, a few quick production headlines uh, or uh, production takeaways. When we started, I was really curious about how EPOS would impact three things, um, story iteration and timelines, director reviews, and the layout or camera phase of production. It's worth noting uh, there was an upfront build cost with using EPOS, but we were mostly using uh, existing stand-in sets, which we pulled from our modeling backlot, where we created really basic shapes just to stay efficient. Uh, in terms of uh, story iteration and timelines, I feel like Ash was indeed able to move through what would usually be complicated technical draws and could then spend his time on the more nuanced acting and emotional beats. So box ticked. Ash was able to save time on the technical, you know, can you shift uh, the camera 10 degrees kinds of notes and iterate faster. In terms of director reviews, these were very different as we essentially went straight from story thumbnail reviews into story layout reviews. The director was suddenly giving camera notes uh, and sets notes earlier and naturally exploring angles in a story review while retaining the charming character acting that Ash had established in the earlier versions of the boards. For me, it was a really nice blend of the best parts of story and layout, the charm of the 2D acting while also establishing where the camera was in the actual set. It was an interesting bridge between story, layout, and art. 
Also, in terms of making adjusts on the fly, we did see some benefits from the real-time aspect of Unreal in that Ash could make changes live in reviews more easily, saving time and helping make decisions in the room versus having to go back, do the work, schedule a time, have another review, etc., etc., etc. So granted, this is a short with a very small crew wearing many hats, but Ash was able to pretty much board the entire short himself and lay out nearly all of the shots as well in Unreal. There were a few tricky shots that needed another camera pass, and all shots needed some level of minor polish, but it proved to me there really is something here that should be explored by larger teams. We were able to retain the charm of 2D story drawings, finding the shots in the set earlier, discovered a lot of uh, improvements we wanted to make earlier, and we did all this naturally and inexpensively earlier than we would have in other pipelines I've worked in. And the director didn't bump when we hit layout, which can often be the case because suddenly the 2D story charm is replaced by gray characters and T-poses or rough animation blocking. Lastly, the animators used Ash's StoryViz EPOS hybrid boards as reference for their acting and where the camera was in the set, so it was a useful blend of inset boarding. So in conclusion, we were certainly impressed, had a blast working with Epic and Praxinos, and are definitely looking forward to the future updates and improvements to EPOS. I would love to test it on a feature or a series scale team and see how a story team uses it and in turn influences the art and camera departments. Um, thanks for your time and we hope this was informative and keep your eyes peeled for the day I became a bird. We think it's going to be something special. And to finish up, here's a little clip of one of our primary look of picture test shots starting from the thumbnail into the boards in EPOS, then animation, then out of uh, the Unreal Engine, and then um, with some 2D blocking of the birds. So we have uh, Ash's original boards, you know, very simple traditional storyboards. Then we've got, we've moved, we moved into the EPOS tool where we have uh, a 2D representation of Ash's boards. We have animation blocking. And then we have the images that are coming directly out of Unreal, which we're really excited about. There's some really interesting looks that we're able to achieve in Unreal, and then we have our 2D blocking pass, um, which involves the birds that we're going to have in this short. Well, thanks for your time, and we hope this has been informative. And keep your eyes peeled for The Day I Became a Bird. We think it's going to be something pretty special. LV, back to you. Thank you guys for your feedback. You see how Praxinos is slowly achieving its goal to make a new 2D animation software powered by Unreal Engine. With the Bricks, Iliad and Epos, we now have the possibility to offer a great storyboard layout tool. Both plugins can be used to create a storyboard based on the 3D environment, as David and Ash explained, but you can also create rough storyboard without any 3D background in order to keep the creative flow before actually placing all the planes in a chosen environment. EPOS offers many other great features. For instance, you can enable a light table on each plane, which will allow you to see the previous and the next image. You can create notes and change the style to give specific information to your coworkers, such as dialogues or retakes. Plus, notes can be displayed on the camera view. You can export your storyboards as image sequences or as videos thanks to the additional plugins Movie Render Queue, Avid and Apple ProRes which are available for free in Unreal Engine. Regarding voice and sound effect, you can import WAV files into the content browser and load them as soundtracks directly into the sequencer. And you can also configure ambient sound to be placed within the 3D environment, which will interact with the camera position. The further, the more silent, the closer, the noiser. And regarding the naming convention, which is a delicate topic in production, EPOS will let you configure various naming patterns for board sequences, shot sequences, takes, planes, and cameras. Plus, you can even benefit from the collaborative tools available in Unreal Engine. 
let me explain. Unreal Engine was basically designed for game developers, and developers use software for versioning and revision control. It means they are used to a system where any big change committed creates a version of their work. This is a great system to track the evolution of a code, to go backward if necessary, and above all, to work in group. And so, thanks to Unreal Engine, this whole logical can be applied to animation production. You can host a project on a SVN solution like Git or Perforce and track the update on the film. Plus, you can even enable the multi-user mode to work together on the same scene. Here is an example where my colleague and I are working on the same scene even if we live 30 kilometers away from each other. He is adding objects and lights in the scene while I am placing cameras and planes at the right spot. Since we are on a multi-user station, I can see in real time the elements added by my colleague. In fact, this behavior is like multiplayer games where you can see other people's actions. But instead of shooting at each other's face, you can create films. Real-time technologies like Unreal Engine are awesome for the ability to easily change renderings and to have a collaborative and iterative workflow. This is a whole new way to make movies, which has the advantage to be more agile and to encourage collaboration between different types of artists. I mean, imagine being a storyboard artist working on a rough storyboard while a background artist will design the 3D environment and come the previous artist who can place planes and camera in the environment while the layout artist cleans the drawing. All of this with the approval of the film director without the need of being physically into the same room, which is a nice argument when you have to lock yourself down at home because of a pandemic. So it's time now to answer the initial question. Why bringing 2D into a 3D game engine may change the animation industry. Well, first, it's useful to bring together all the tools you need to produce animated content. Real-time and 2D can perfectly coexist and serve each other for a better efficiency. Real-time technologies will enhance animation production thanks to their collaborative and iterative philosophy. Real-time technologies can ease remote work or co-productions involving several studios. Producing animations directly in Odyssey means you can reuse all the assets to produce video games with Unreal Engine. And it works the other way around. This is why at Praxinos we have been working so hard to implement 2D animation in Unreal Engine. This is not easy, but it's worth it. Or at least I hope I have been able to convince you. <laughs> Regarding the release of Odyssey as a standalone software, well, there are still a lot to do, such as improving the user experience or adding tools for 2D animators, but we are still aiming to release a first official version next year. In the meantime, don't forget you can already test modules that make Odyssey up, Iliad and Epos, which are both free and available on Unreal Engine Marketplace. Iliad is the versatile painting tool that can be used to edit textures used for characters, paint on static meshes, create 2D flipbooks, create decals, paint past process volumes, Paint foliages, and obviously create as many powerful brushes as you need. By the way, even if all brushes use a nodal based engine, you won't have to deal with Blueprint to use Iliad. The plugin offers 75 default brushes, and if you need more, we also sell various brush packs on the marketplace. And of course, there is Epos, the storyboard manager plugin that has just been released. 
By the way, both plugins work on Unreal Engine 5, and sources are provided when you download Iliad and Epos from the marketplace. If necessary, we also have a GitHub repository for each plugin if you want to create forks. Mentioning open source, I must highlight the fact that developing Iliad, Epos, and Odyssey has been possible thanks to a homemade graphic library named Ulyss. Ulyss has been developed to replace the library OpenCV, which was used in 2019 to develop Iliad. We could not keep working with OpenCV because it was slow, it was not optimized for the peculiar context of 2D animation in a 3D environment, and it could only use RGB color models. Our library, Ulyss, has fixed these issues as it's a powerful C++ library that manages image processing, including color models, color spaces, blending modes, channel depth, image pool, optimization algorithm with multi-threading. Plus, Ulyss is cross-platform, Windows and Mac. Sources are also available on GitHub, and it's still being improved to meet the needs of Odyssey. Mentioning Odyssey, if you want to be kept informed about potential beta test, pre-order or official release, you can flash this QR code to subscribe our mailing list. And you can also follow us on a bunch of social media. Thank you all for your attention. I hope this conference was interesting. Thanks to FMX crew for giving Fraxinos the opportunity to tell our story and project. Thanks to Epic Games and to its great people, Sebastian, Mark, Ben, Rob, Jordan, Akira, and all your colleagues. Thanks also for the Mega Grant program, which allowed Fraxinos to develop Iliad, Epos, and Odyssey. Thanks to all beta testers, and especially David and Ash, for their great work on The Day I Became a Bird. I really can't wait to see the final film, and I hope we will be working together again in the near future. And obviously, thanks to my amazing co-workers, they are the two magicians who made all of this possible. Before we start the Q&A session, I would like you to enjoy this short sequence animated with Epos and Iliad. See you after this. <laughs>